Hi, everybody, and welcome to our fifth and final hangout in celebration of World Oceans Week. Today we are talking about marine protected areas, the creation of and the fight for their existence. We are joined by experts from the Sargasso Sea Alliance, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, Seascape Consultants, and Marviva. Our guests include Dr. David Freestone, Jim Barnes, Professor David Johnson, and Dr. Jorge Jimenez. Um, if you want to get in touch with these guys, these are some links to their websites and their Twitter accounts. But we can get back to that later. Let's jump right into the main topic. We're talking. Lost in effort. She's coming. She's coming back. Here she comes. We can't hear you, Samantha. Just kidding. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> some, sometimes Google doesn't like when I screen share, so apologies. Um, welcome back, everybody. So without further ado, I'm going to have our guests introduce themselves. I'm going to start with Dr. Jorge Jimenez. Uh, Dr. Jimenez, can you please introduce our, yourself to our audience? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, well, I'm based in Costa Rica, and I'm uh, directing the Marviva Foundation, which is a a regional NGO working out of the Pacific coast of Colombia, Panama, and Costa Rica. I am a marine biologist by training and, and has been on, on the conservation uh, of marine ecosystem side during the last seven years. And David number one, we'll get to David number two in a second. <laughs> Hello, yes, I'm, I'm David Johnson. I'm a professor of coastal management and I work for a small consulting company uh, called Seascape Consultants, which is working for a range of intergovernmental organizations, the Conservation and Biological Diversity, the United Nations Environment Programme, Seabed Authority. Um, before that, I was the Executive Secretary for the OSPAR Commission in charge of uh, environmental protection of the Northeast Atlantic. And David Freestone, please introduce yourself. Yeah, David Freestone. I'm the uh, executive director of the Sargasso Sea Alliance, which is an alliance of uh, like-minded organizations led by the government of Bermuda, which is seeking to establish protection measures for the Sargasso Sea in the North Atlantic. Yeah, I'm actually an international environmental lawyer, which is an un unusual expertise in this company, so very nice to meet me here. And Jim Barnes. Yes, uh, I'm the director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. It's uh, an old coalition. We started it in 1978 at a time when Antarctica was facing two big challenges. One was the uh, negotiation of a fisheries convention. I'll tell you more about that later, but it became the governance structure for Antarctic fishing and protected areas and they were thinking about mining and we started a big campaign, global campaign, to stop them from opening up Antarctica to mining <coughs> and instead they negotiated an environmental protection protocol to the Antarctic Treaty. So this coalition has 25 full members, Greenpeace, WWF, Friends of the Earth and many others in 10 countries and we have a seat at the table of the Antarctic Treaty System governance body. So we're the NGO accredited and we work scientifically, policy-wise, all kinds of levels. We have a big team. Thank you for all introducing yourselves. So, you know, all of you represent many facets of our ocean, and I think it's important that we define what a marine protected area is and why it's important. People feel comfortable and familiar with national parks on land, um, which 12% of land is protected, whereas less than 2% of the ocean is protected. Um, can you define for us David um, Freestone, what the differences are between um, different marine protected areas? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is not, we don't want to get too complicated with this, but um, there are some areas which uh, in coastal waters in the 200 mile zones of, of uh, estates have been set aside uh, as pro uh, various sorts of protection from various different types of risks from vessel source pollution, for example, from vessels, the traffic of vessels, from fishing, uh, from even from, even from um, recreational uses. Uh, and then there are uh, 
areas which are particularly pristine or need to be protected for certain uh, scientific reasons, for ecological reasons, which are you know, either a useful term will be a reserve, which is where no activities are allowed at all. So it's a fairly broad church. It covers a range of activities, uh, and there are some areas, and you, you've met, we've been talking about this before, which has actually been recognised by UNESCO, by the World Heritage uh, Convention, as actually World Heritage Sites. And those are mostly uh, <coughs> they important reef areas like the Great Barrier Reef. But there are no areas beyond national jurisdiction, as we call it, beyond 200 miles in the high seas, which have been recognised by UNESCO as, as being World Heritage Sites. So once we move away from the 200 mile zone into the high seas, then the whole, uh, the whole question becomes much more complex. And the, the, three, the four people you've got here today are actually working mostly on high seas areas. So <coughs> this is cutting edge stuff. So reserves, if you like, which are completely pr pristine, protected for certain purposes, much broader church, different types of protection, and then world heritage. But world heritage sites don't go out into the high seas. David Johnson, can you elaborate on marine protected areas and um, what maybe what obstacles people face in creating them in the high seas? Um, yeah, well, I'm really passionate about marine protected areas because I think they are the underdog. <laughs> so. Marine protected areas um, are much uh, well behind the level of protection that we can see on land. So, for example, David Freestone mentioned the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. There are 46 marine sites of the 962 sites that UNESCO recognized. Uh, David mentioned also that there are less than 2% uh, of the ocean coverage is protected and even that as as he said is cut up into high levels of protection and then multiple use so the barriers to creating uh, marine protected areas are that somebody somewhere has to lose out or, or or have less access to an area than they would do otherwise and therefore you've got to um, convince a range of stakeholders that the biodiversity or, or the flora and fauna in a particular marine area are so important that they have to be protected and that they have to be protected through a management plan and through different conservation objectives. And that requires uh, getting different people to agree. It requires uh, eventually passing some kind of a legal basis and making sure uh, that you enforce and protect that area uh, from uh, any particular threats, whether it be uh, shipping, whether it be activities such as uh, uh, intensive fishing or, or um, uh, other activities like uh, noise pollution from uh, sonar, military sonar, for example. You know, can maybe Dr. Jimenez, can you tell us, is a marine protected area enough to keep our seas healthy and preserved? Well, that 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 is uh, the primary purpose of a marine protected area. But the fact is that usually, and especially in oceanic conditions, everything is interlinked. Not only through the movement of currents, but the, through the movement of fauna. Also, so we have we have now come to to some reality checks in, in this concept when especially a watershed associated pollution coming from the land into the sea is affecting the, the protected areas and therefore is showing that uh, the protected area itself is not able to sustain or conserve or preserve the, the resources that we were, we were looking at. Yeah. Also when, when those protected areas encompass resources that are migratory like especially pelagic migratory resources Usually, uh, the the relationship between uh, between the conservation of in this particular site, protected site, has to be coordinated with the conservation in other areas. So, so yes, I think that the the migration, the watershed issues, is a uh, is a is a concept that has uh, led us to to ask whether we are actually building up islands of conservation uh, in a sea of destruction. And whether we really have to to look at, at the whole uh, ocean ecosystem uh, and and therefore uh, manage the, the ocean in different ways, uh, but not uh, uh, it looks like it's not enough only to do MPAs from our perspective. 
Jim, how can you do you want to contribute to your experience with the Antarctic and Southern Ocean? Sure. Um, the Antarctic's really a little different from most other parts of the high seas, and mainly that's because um, there are claims there, but the claims are not um, allowed to be alive. So in the face of these seven countries' claims, the governor, the, go the governments a long time ago negotiated a, a, a treaty called the Antarctic Treaty. And since then, there's a series of other treaties I mentioned earlier. And so we have a governance structure. If um, the people who control the Antarctic Treaty system, that's about 28 countries, if they want to create large marine reserves and a network of marine protected areas, which they promised, <coughs> they have committed to do this, several years ago, and they set a target date for 2012. And sadly, there were three countries at last year's meeting that said, no, we can't accept it yet. So this year, we have a special meeting. It's in Bremerhaven, Germany, in um, about a month. And these two key proposals for the Ross Sea and for East Antarctica, two huge areas totaling over 3 million square kilometers, if both of them were agreed. Um, with large chunks of marine reserves, like along the whole slope and shelf of the Ross Sea, one of the last really wild oceans left on Earth, um, and then large chunks of the East Antarctica uh, coastal area. So we have a, a real chance to uh, get a big agreements in, in, in this year, I think. But the, the usual factors that have been mentioned, and we all know so well, are right there. So the fishing industry is very powerful. The fishing industries in a few countries, that includes New Zealand, uh, Russia, Korea, Japan, Ukraine, and so forth, they want to keep fishing. They don't want to allow creating these big MPAs. So we're down, we're, we're 25 to 3 right now if you want to look at the votes. And our job, uh, our coalition and all the governments that are on our side in the next month before Bremerhaven and then the rest of the year before the annual meeting in October, our job is to convince all 28 countries to accept these uh, large MPAs. It'd be a great step forward for Antarctica, and I think for the world as a whole. Um, but it's hanging in the balance, to be honest. It's not clear that the political will is there. I mean, I know I've signed the watch, um, and I think it's important <laughs> that other people everybody, do. Everybody should sign the watch. Post yeah. that at some point, would you? I will, I'll, I'll actually I'll share the website on our Google Plus page so that people can get familiar and sign the watch. And I'll also share a trailer for um, the Ross Sea, which is the, the last ocean, which discusses the Ross Sea and why it's so important and why the health of it and the protection of it is really so important um, for the future health of our oceans. Um, you know, the, the film itself discusses why this the creation of an MPA in this region is so important. Can you speak to us about what kind of species would be protected um, if this MPA and hopefully this MPA is um, created? Yeah, sure. Um, what you have in the Ross Sea, it's mainly, it's, it's luck in some respects. It's the ice. The ice has been the bane of fishermen's um, lives since whalers went there a long time ago. So at the peak of whaling, all the rest of the Antarctic waters were hit pretty hard. But the Ross Sea, it lost some mainly blue whales, the big ones, and that was important. But unlike other parts of the Antarctic and the rest of the world, they didn't uh, lose very many as a big percentage, so to speak. So all the top trophic levels are still essentially fully intact. And it's only been in the last 15 years they started fishing. Now what they're fishing for mainly is a thing called Antarctic toothfish, Ross Sea toothfish. And it is it plays the role of a shark in this ecosystem. There are no sharks there. It acts like a shark. It eats like a shark. It plays that role. It's an amazing fish. It lives to be 50 or 60 years old. Um, it's thought, we don't even know, that it starts to spawn when it's 15 or 16 years old and so forth. We know relatively little about it that hasn't stopped the governments from going fishing there. And it's called an experimental or exploratory fishery. It's never been fully assessed, which is a technical term of importance and so forth. Um, and so if we can create the kind of MPA or marine reserve that the NGOs have in mind and that the U.S. and some other countries have in mind, it will close out some of the fishing. But the, the, Rossi is a huge area. We'd like to close immediately 1.7 million square kilometers, say big area. But 
there's another 1.7 million square kilometers that would be left under various states. Some of it is um, not so ice infested and can be fished. Um, but it's a very, very large area. And the species include well, almost all the true Antarctic quails, the blue whale, the biggest animal ever on Earth, I believe, humpback whales, fin whales, minke whales, the little whale, there's a lot of those. Um, every kind of penguin that is uh, an iconic species, there are huge, huge concentrations of emperors and kings and all the other penguins. The colossal squid was found uh, not so long ago in Antarctica, and it's an amazing species all by itself, you know. There's we actually a, had um, Edie Witter on just the other day. Yeah, no, it's awesome. To her. She's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a Ross Sea killer whale, a type C, a new species discovered only in the last 10 years in the Ross Sea. There's, I think, 30% or 40% of the world population of those are there. And the rest are next door around in the Waddell Sea. But it, it's, it's an amazing place, the Ross Sea. And, and one of the really cool things about it, from my point of view, is that scientists, not fishermen, but scientists have been studying it for about 50 or 60 years rather intensively. So we have very, very long time series of data about the Ross Sea and about most of the species there, whether it's the albatrosses in the air, the penguins of various types, the seals and, uh, and so forth, uh, and now this giant squid. There's just a lot going on down there, and it's more or less intact. A few years back, a group of uh, scientists around the world were trying to come up with what are the least affected large marine ecosystems on Earth. And the Ross Sea and the Waddell Sea were picked to be two of the uh, least impacted, and the Ross Sea is thought by many to be the last ocean of its type left. So it's very, very special. Let me ask you a question. So it sounds like the Ross Sea is teeming with life, and it seems like the one thing that fishermen want is to fish. So it seems silly that they would ruin a beautiful, pristine area of our ocean just to fish for one fish. Um, what is toothfish sold as in stores? You know, if people are going to their market, how can they avoid buying, ordering, or purchasing this kind of fish at the market? That's a good question, and they'll never see it called toothfish because that's not a very consumer-friendly term. In the U.S. and U.K. and some other places, they call it Chilean sea bass. Chilean sea bass used to be a commercial viable species caught off the coast of Chile, not surprisingly. And um, con consumers know what it looks and tastes like. It's a deep water fish. It's delicious. Toothfish are in some broad sense related to uh, these, tooth th these Chilean sea bass, maybe, but not really. But their meat is like people imagine a Chilean sea bass is. So it's mainly marketed in the U.S., which is one of the biggest markets for toothfish on Earth, along with uh, Japan and Korea and the U.K., and uh, it's a high-end dish. It costs a lot of money, relatively speaking, to buy it. It's not a cheap uh, fish. Um, I think I've got a picture of a toothfish here. Hold on. I'm going to share wonderful, that. wonderful thing. Share that with people. I love those toothfish. <laughs> um, I'm, you'll tell me if this is the correct species. Yeah, that's a toothfish. But that, that's a little one. That's a that I think that may be a Patagonian toothfish. It may I don't think that's a Ross Sea Antarctic toothfish, but I'll ha I'll have to do a better search. But I just while you were talking, I wanted to find one as an example. Um, it's a shame that they don't advertise its face. Then maybe if they showed its face, people wouldn't eat it. Maybe they wouldn't think it was so delicious. <laughs> um, so why don't we move over to? Um, to Dr. Jimenez and tell us about um, what you're doing with Marviva and the, the work that you're doing to preserve the coastlines in your area and, um, and talk to us about why there needs to be protection. Well, this is a, in the eastern tropical Pacific, it's an area that, that is very different from the Ross Sea in the terms of, uh, of the diversity of species, but, but also on the size of the population. So it's the typical tropical conditions in which you in which you have a, a very high diversity, very low stocks of different species. And uh, uh, unfortunately, all the coastal area has been depleted now. And, and so in, in terms of, of resources, we are facing uh, threats by coastal contamination, which is becoming a real issue in this area. Uh, 
but also because even though uh, we have a start to create MPAs in the area, we are still very low, especially outside the 12 miles limit. You know, most of the, of the MPAs that have been created in this region are uh, within this 12 miles. For example, in Costa Rica, there is uh, already about 17% of the territorial waters under MPAs, and that is national parks mostly, so non-take areas. So, so that, that is a high percentage already, even though uh, enforcement is so low that most of them are paper parks uh, in, in that sense. Uh, so we, we do help the governments to uh, em do enforcement first, to do prosecution, that is one of the lines that, that, that we work with. But the other line that we are working with is basically working with coastal communities. And coastal communities are becoming very important in the management of MPAs because first, they have to understand the importance of the MPA and they have to agree on the different management issues related with, with the activities that they can do within the MPAs. For example, in some of the coastal MPAs in this region, we have developed uh, micro-enterprises in tourism, which uh, formerly were illegal fishers going into the MPAs, and now they are uh, whale watchers, for example, going and taking tourists into the MPAs, according with a, with a responsible code. And, and the, the beauty of that is that, you know, as one, one fisherman was telling me, I used to earn $300 per month fishing. Now I earn $300 per day taking tourists into the MPA. So it's a win-win it's a situation. And, and I think that, that that's the type of thing that we are, we are trying to proliferate uh, along the coast of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. The, and, the, and the other issue that we are dealing with is, is basically uh, trying to, to have a more uh, learned consumer in terms of fish products uh, because uh, because certainly that is the, the the highest pressure that we have now in the MPAs in the, in the region is is illegal fishing. So there is a wide role uh, of activities that we do in terms of uh, of uh, fishing activities in the in the MPAs. Not only the prosecution part, but uh, but also the the regulatory part. So we help the government to create new laws, new regulations. Uh, and also we train inspectors, for example, at the port. Uh, we, we train uh, park rangers at, at, in the marine parks, et cetera. Um, and Professor Johnson, can you speak to us about your experience? You successfully created an MPA, and I want to hear about your experience in doing that and, and how you were successful. You know, what did it take to get so many countries involved? Uh, well, I had the pleasure of working for a convention. This is 15 uh, different countries around the Northeast Atlantic, as well as the European Union. Uh, and what they decided in 2010 was that the ministers of those countries would sign up to uh, a network, a preliminary network of six uh, high seas marine protected areas um, around the uh, um, sort of centered on the mid Atlantic ridge in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, and these protect seamounts and areas of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that are representative. Um, it's, it's really important to uh, <coughs> stress, though, that um, there needs to be collaboration on the high seas, not only between uh, states that are protecting the environment, but states that are in charge of uh, shipping, international shipping, uh, and states that are in charge of deep sea mining uh, and fishing as well. So the high seas is an area where the stakeholders or the, or the interested parties are really quite different from the communities that George was talking about just now. Um, because uh, the high seas are uh, under nobody's jurisdiction and uh, the United Nations law of the sea confers a certain uh, number of freedoms to countries to undertake different activities. So it was a, a business, in, in, in my experience, of trust building and negotiation uh, using the important non-governmental organizations like WWF in our case, uh, states that had sympathy with creating a marine protected area like Portugal who have uh, large areas of uh, um, area uh, in an extended continental shelf uh, and then working by consensus. 
And David Freestone, can you speak to me about why you're so passionate about MPAs and why is the Sargasso Sea a unique ec ecosystem worthy of protection? Okay, certainly, yes. <clears throat> and over my right shoulder, there's actually a map of the Sargasso Sea. I think first thing is to say where it is. It's, uh, it's uh, in the North Atlantic between the US and, and Europe. Um, it's about 2 million square miles. And its distinctive feature is that it's uh, in a gyre, which is there, and thanks, we have a, a map coming up here. The jar with the um, uh, series of currents and clockwise direction, which actually hold, <clears throat> in the Pacific, we know that the gyres actually hold garbage. Well, in the, in the Atlantic, it's actually sargasso weed, sargassum weed, two, two varieties, which are what are called holopelagic, which means that they reproduce without contact with the, with the beach, without, uh, with, the, with the ground. So they just reproduce, they fragment and grow and fragment, etc. So, so these gyres hold this huge um, accumulations of weed, actually, in the, in the air, air of the ocean ocean, which is often regarded, those areas are usually regarded as something of a desert. So because you have this kind of coastal type environment, two, three hundred miles, thousand miles from coast, uh, animals flock to it. So it has its own endemic species and species of shrimp and fish that actually live and uh, reproduce in the in the weed itself. But it also acts as a kind of habitat for turtles, baby turtles, swim out from the coasts of uh, the US, uh, the Caribbean, and then they spend their lost years, as it's called, from the very little tiny chaps that we see on the beach uh, until they start to be able to undertake long transatlantic voy voyages. Uh, transoceanic voyages and they actually spend perhaps five six years actually in the weed eating it and pr being protected and it also provides habitat for a large number of commercial species a lot of, of uh, tuners as well particularly a couple of types particularly we think that um, it's a bluefin seem to be uh, in the Sargasso Sea at a time when in other places they're spawning in, in the Gulf of Mexico we know other types of Yellowfin and, uh, and others actually do spawn in the uh, in the Sargasso Sea and marlins definitely, which are really heavily pressured. So a lot of commercial species also depend on it for for their existence. And the kind of uh, it's difficult to call eels uh, iconic, but it's also very important because it's the only place in the world where the European eel and the American eel spawn. These are what are called catadromous species. That means Unlike anadromous species like like um, uh, salmon, which live their life in the salt water and then move into freshwater rivers to spawn and, and die, reproduce, and then the little chaps go out to the ocean and then find their way back, eels are exactly the reverse. This is an amazing story. The, the European eel, for example, travels 3,000 miles. The gravid females go out to the to the uh, to the Sargasso Sea, just north, just south of Bermuda. And then they spawn and they die. And the little leptocephali, the little, little uh, spawn, find their way back to Europe. So that's an amazing story, like 3,000 miles. It's never been witnessed. Uh, we know that it takes place in certain areas because we can catch the small, small fry as they actually, you know, at certain stages. But the, the, the spawning process has never been witnessed. So this, so Sargasso Sea really is quite a, an unusual well, it's a completely unique ecosystem because it's the only one which is based entirely on these, uh, these spores of sargassum. Now, it's, apart from the islands of Bermuda, it's pretty principally high seas. So we were talking, you know, you were talking previously to Jim and to, uh, and, and to David who are working within an, an environmental treaty system. They actually, there's a, the uh, um, Antarctic treaty system actually has environmental provisions for provide the basis for, for what they're trying to do. You know, they've yet to be used properly, as he was telling us, and we certainly wish them every success. And David's in, uh, OSPAR treaty, actually, the parties decide, provides for the establishment of marine protected areas. But the Sargasso Sea is still pristine high seas. So what we're trying to do is to actually get the countries that are around the the, um, uh, the uh, Sargasso Sea, if you could put that map up again, you can see this includes the North American countries like the United States and Canada, but also the Bahamas, Dominican Republic, uh, and then the Azores to the east, the Portuguese Azores, as well as the countries that are interested from the European Union, where that's the, that's the map, which is, thank you for putting that up, 
that shows the uh, the countries around it. Um, but the countries that from which the eels come are also concerned because eels are now at something like less than five percent of their historic levels. So so seriously uh, are threatened and are actually critically endangered according to the IUCN Red List uh, that the European Union has imposed very serious restrictions on on their catch and has actually required all the members of the European Union to actually uh, implement uh, species recovery plans for them. So this is a you know this is the place where they where the eels spawn. It's an important commercial uh, area, it's an area for important commercial species, but also for a lot of endangered species uh, like the sea turtles. But also you know, the whales are coming back to uh, to Bermuda as well. Humpbacks and uh, and sperm whales are coming back. So um, this is we we are, we are um, not working within the the uh, framework of an environmental treaty. So we have to kind of event this as we go along. Uh, we're not working with the only coastal state we're working with closely is, is Bermuda itself, as, uh, as Jorge does. Um, but we're, we're kind of forging our way um, on, on this by ourselves. And what we've decided to do with the leadership of Bermuda, which is actually an overseas territory of the UK, is to go to the, to the organizations which have responsibility for policing activities in the high seas, which David Johnson really itemized for us, the, the International Maritime Organization, for example, which regulates vessels and vessel source pollution based in London, the Seabed Authority, which regulates seabed mining, which is in Jamaica, and then the, a number of fishing organizations, or actually one main one which, which regulates tuners in the Atlantis, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuners based in Madrid. And we're actually going to these organizations, putting the case for the protection of the Sargassus Sea and asking for protection measures. And we currently have considerations between before ICAT, we're talking about the sort of measures we may put before the International Maritime Organization. So this is where I'm talking, when we talked earlier about what a protected area is, I take, have to take a rather more pragmatic view because what we're saying is we're not saying this is an area which all countries will recognize as being protected you know, for all purposes. It's not, a, it's not a pristine reserve, but what we do want to see is that the threats which it faces from fish shipping, mining, uh, fishing would actually be addressed by the relevant sectoral organizations on that responsibility. It's a rather different proposition. But I know that to, as a segue into what uh, Jorge is doing, he's attempting a similar project in relation to this very important area in, in, the, in the dome, in the Pacific Dome. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the Pacific Dome? Yes, basically, this is a this is a, a an oceanographic feature that occurs at the uh, in front of the ex exclusive economic zone of all the Central American countries. It is a, a huge area, over one million square kilometers, uh, and it's only recently that we have been linking that area with with uh, with the life cycles of uh, endangered species like the, the blue whales for example, that now it has been documented that they actually come from Alaska and the western coast of, uh, of uh, North America to, uh, to breed in those areas. And also uh, the leatherback uh, turtles that uh, are nesting in the Central American coast actually spend the juvenile stages in this area, which is a high productivity area, very, very high productivity, is, is not an upwelling area, and that's why it's called the dome, because because there, there is a pushing up of the thermocline, but actually there is not reaching the, the surface. It, it, it stayed close to, to the surface, but, but not reaching. But, but enough to, to produce a high uh, volume of phytoplankton that sustain a, a very complicated food chain in which uh, blue whales and tunas and sharks uh, and squids are uh, involved. And so, beside being a, a very diverse area in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, marine life uh, is also a very important area in terms of tuna fishing especially. So uh, we are now trying to, to see how we first recognize and, and, and make all the governments in the region recognize the importance of this area, uh, but also how we are going to start dealing with the, with the industrial fleet. Uh, and this is international fleet, it's from over 20 countries that arrived to this area to, to actually do tuna fishing. So we are in the process of, uh, at this moment, securing a, a joint declaration by the governments of Central America to 
to call the attention to the world of, of the need to handle or manage this area with a, with a special consideration because of uh, its diversity and its productivity. So, uh, so this is a, is a different uh, type of work uh, from what we do at, at the coastal areas. This is high seas, mostly, 70% of, of, the, of the domains in the high seas. So it has to, to go through international conventions, uh, regional organizations, and, and so it's a, it's a different game, uh, certainly. It sounds like it's complicated to get any regulations passed in the high seas, and, and what happens in our oceans really affects all of our lives. Um, you know, it seems like the countries that are keeping these MPAs from being created really are doing that selfishly because there's something that they want there and they want to continue to take whatever that is. And if the high seas belong to no one and also belong to all of us, then maybe how dare they take those things and claim them for themselves. So. How do we get people to feel more inspired and more connected to this area of our ocean that they may never see, taste, or touch? You know, throughout our series of conversations this week, we've been trying to encourage people to become more curious and to become more connected and feel more um, sort of feel more that, you know, the ocean is more than just a place to go to on vacation. There are species and there's marine life and there's things that exist out there that are important to all of us and are important to the health of our planet. Um, you know, it seems like there's some sense of ease in trying to create regulation in coastal areas because that's nation specific. So how do we make people feel more connected to, um, to the high seas and the importance of creating MPAs? Or better yet, why don't you tell our audience why you think MPAs are so important and what made you feel inspired to want to get involved? Um, I'll start with um, with David Johnson and then go down the list. So, David, why don't you tell us uh, how you feel about this? Uh, well, thanks, Sam. I, I think um, marine areas are inspiring. I've just been to uh, uh, the Philippines to Tabataha Reefs, which is a most fantastic, uh, huge coral atoll. It's probably the best coral atoll uh, in the world. Um, it's a World Heritage Site. And it's an absolutely fantastic. It's within national jurisdiction, but a most inspiring site. So personal experience is really important in all of that. I've been paddling around the ocean for 50, more than 50 years. And I think um, there's really good reason to um, make these changes and, and, make, and, and preserve areas. Uh, how do we get people involved? Well, I think the net is fantastic from your other hangouts. You've... Uh, been given some really good examples of, of who is involved, who's inspiring. I think the Aquaria, the World Ocean Network is, is fantastic in terms of that. Going out, getting out to sea like you can see there, watching whales in the Azores um, is really important. Uh, I like the idea of bringing professionals together, so the uh, impact the International Marine Protected Areas Conference in Marseille later this year will be important. And the work that we've been talking about, all of us, is represented on the net. So for me, the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone, if anybody Googles that, you can see uh, the type of things that, that we've been doing. Um, I, I was thinking if I had a chance to influence a bunch of ministers, what would I, what would I do? Well, I'd take them on a Noah's Ark out to the ocean and I'd show them whale sharks, fantastically huge creatures, but seahorses as well, tiny little things. I'd take them to a tropical coral reef, I'd take them to a cold water <coughs> coral reef, I'd take them to a kelp forest with sea otters, I'd take them right to the bottom of the ocean if I could, right down to 5,000 meters. And you can make sure that those people who are articulate and sell the message would, would then do so. Um, and things have got to such a level um, that at the moment there are several initiatives. There's something called the Global Ocean Commission, which is trying to influence opinion, is trying to get people to realize that now is the chance uh, to act on oceans and to make more protected areas than we currently have and to take more initiatives um, and, and get things done. So I think it's about involving people, showing them you don't have to be a person privileged person that goes to the bottom of the ocean in a, a submersible but you can see the pictures and you can see the things that are there and 
you know, by goodness, they're worth looking after. Well, I absolutely think we need more MPAs, but I'm available for your Noah's Ark journey. So <laughs> if you feel, I'm not a minister, but if you feel like you want to bring me, I'm totally open. Um, Excellent. Yeah, you're on. <laughs> perfect. Um, David Freestone, I'd love to hear from you about um, how you feel and how, why you're inspired for creating MPAs and why this means something to you. Well, I think, I mean, I'd like to use the example of Sargasso C. David, David's uh, a little, I, I, you know, what he said was tremendous, and I agree entirely. Um, but we, we're actually working with this very small place, at, uh, Bermuda, which is 65,000 people. And we've really been able to capture a lot of national um, enthusiasm for the protection of the Sargasso Sea. They're right in the middle of the Sargasso Sea, and they understand how important it is for the, even just for the creation of Bermuda, for the the, the Sargassum wa washing up on their shores for millennium is a reason, one of the reasons for fertile uh, soils that they have and for the protection of their coast. So they sort of understand this, but they're also excited by the diversity there. If you go out, as I've been, uh, and you take a small clump of Sargassum and you shake it into a bucket, you get all the sorts of things that David was saying, little, little, little Sargassum fish, little uh, shrimps and little crabs which are actually the color of sargassum and even if you're lucky even little marlin you know with the, with the sails etc about three four inches long which are just absolute knockout so it is a it's very exciting i think that the way is the, the uh, start with the ministers uh, and we actually are trying what we're trying to do is to uh, early next year to hold a meeting in bermuda of the countries that are actually interested in joining us on this venture and, and you'd be surprised how, well, I was surprised. Um, it was my job to make people interested, but it was not such a hard job in many respects as I thought it would be. There's a lot of enthusiasm for, for this. Um, European countries are excited by it. I think even coming to Bermuda in the winter is a sort of great draw as well. But, but uh, without being cynical, I think it's really been a, it's a lot of interest in just this really unique ecosystem. So I think we start from from governments have to be interested in this, and it's you know I think that we're at the stage where uh, we're used to having protected areas on land. I mean, if you talk to two percent of the, of land territory in a country be, being part of a park, it would be scandalous. Uh, you know, we used to these huge areas in the U.S. The Yellowstone Park in the U.K. had the huge areas in in, uh, in Scotland, etc., in North North York Moors and, and uh, and the Peak Districts, which are, you know, people all, all take great pleasure in visiting and, you know, treasuring as part of their national heritages. Um, and this is our global heritage. And so the ocean is, a, you know, an important shared resource. And because it's a, one of the problems is you can't see a lot from the surface. You do actually need to look underneath. You need to see, uh, as David was saying, takes down to the bottom maybe, but to, to go to coral reefs and areas... A lot of the, a lot of this uh, of interest in this is being engendered by, uh, you know, by filmmakers and by uh, uh, tremendous scientific uh, kind of discoveries and uh, and reports that we get. So, so, so to summarize. I think we start with governments. With governments it spills down, but there's there's also a, as your Terramar project shows a great deal of of, of uh, ground swell support for for. Uh, uh, stressing the, and recognizing the importance of the oceans. Thank you for that plug. Um, you know, we hope to be a place where people can feel that they can get educated about what's happening in the ocean. Um, but I would love to hear why Jim was inspired to start caring about the Antarctic. So please do tell us. Well, uh, part of it's by just luck of, of fate or whatever. Um, I met Sir Peter Scott, the son of Robert Falcon Scott, uh, about 35 years ago. And he was the co-founder of WWF, among other things. And he cared passionately about the oceans and about Antarctica. And um, first time I met him, he said, we need some people who are going to take care of the 10% of the Earth that doesn't belong to anybody else at all. And part of that 10% is Antarctica and the big ocean around it, the Southern Ocean. And he was in instrumental in getting me to start this coalition with several friends in 1978. Um, over the years, I've been really privileged to know a wide range of top-class scientists who are devoting their entire lives to studying places like the Roth Sea or the Waddell Sea, etc. And I know dozens of these scientists, some of them I've known for 30, 40 years now. And they bring forward their stories 
and their stories are very powerful stories just based on the science. And about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, um, my coalition started trying to work more coherently, I could say, with the scientists to make a movie. And that's the last ocean movie that you referred to earlier, and I hope people can have a chance to see that. But we wanted to have a way to capture the reality of the Ross Sea along with the politics about how we get to closure on a marine reserve MPA uh, network in the Ross Sea of any value. And the movie tries to tell that story. And we have used this movie as a tool, for example. We've shown it to heads of state. We've shown it to foreign ministers. Uh, when we showed it to Hillary Clinton uh, a couple of years ago, she really got stoked and motivated and decided to really weigh in. And she was incredibly helpful, as the senator announced, Secretary of State Kerry. Um, and we're continuing to do that. It's in film festivals all over the world. Uh, it's, it's intensely in the United States right now. I think it was in New York City last night or two nights ago, for example, and it's in California this week. Um, but we're trying to use that as a, as a window into one part of Antarctica. So that's one of our main educational tools, you could say. But then going back to the government side, we have to convince at the end of the day 28 governments to at least not say no. In a consensus system, they don't have to raise their flag and say, Russia votes yes. Thank God they don't have to do that. They just have to be quiet. They have to be silent. And that's part of what this lobby game is all about, trying to encourage, find the comfort zone, so to speak, that doesn't give away the whole store. That, you know, difficult countries like Russia and China and so forth, they usually want something. And the question is, what? what? Can we give it to them or not? I don't know the answer to that question exactly. Somebody has to have a bottom line, you could say, at some point, or the MPA wouldn't be a, a great value. It could be cut back too far. But anyway, so that, that vision, and I want to show you again. You've got this somewhere else, but this is a, um, I don't know if you can see this. This is a map that we did last year of all the areas around Antarctica, we found 19 areas covering about 40% of the Antarctic. We wrote a legacy report for the governments. We don't try to hide anything from these governments. We want all the science information, all the geographical, other information there, so they can't shrink from it. And then they know the truth, so to speak. So that's part of our job, too. And then we work really, really closely with people like Sylvia Earle. Uh, she's been a friend of mine for 35 years or so. And um, Mission Blue is part of our coalition, and we collaborate on all kinds of things. And uh, Leonard, Leonardo DiCaprio is an ambassador for the Antarctic Ocean Alliance, which is our key partner. When we wanted to create this global public campaign, we created something new. And so if people want to join the watch, and it helps. We'd like 25,000 people in Russia to join the watch so that Mr. Putin knows that people care there, for example. Um, so we have this larger coalition, the Antarctic uh, Ocean Alliance, uh, which brings, I don't know, most all of my key member groups uh, and several other groups as well, uh, brings actors and actresses who care. We're just trying everything we can to get the message out in China. We have stars in China helping us and Korea and so forth, you know. And it's like... No holds barred. We're going to try everything we can think of to bring this over the line. Because if we do, it'll be really, really important for Antarctica and thus for the world as a whole. Uh, and it will give, I think, um, a good incentive and maybe a good precedent inspiration for people in more difficult political climes. Because at least, as I said earlier, they have a governance structure there. So uh, it's unlike the situation in Sargosa Sea where you don't have a governance structure. And, uh, if they can't do it in the Antarctica, then it will be very much more difficult, I think, in a lot of other places. If they can do it there and do it seriously and do it well, it will set a very good uh, precedent for all of our work elsewhere. I think that's a great point, Jim. I think success stories are really important, and there aren't enough success stories about marine protected areas out there, um, particularly in the high seas, um, as there are none <laughs> currently. Um, and I think that you're all working very hard to... Sorry, go ahead. There's one, a big one, so in the Antarctica two years ago, to prove their concept, so to speak, they started in 2009 with the concept of a network of large marine 
protected areas around Antarctica. And they uh, came up with a large one. It's about 960,000 square kilometers or something like that in um, the South Orkney Islands area. And it's largely no-take. And so it proved that they could do it. And now we're trying to get them to prove it again. But this, on your list, there's one large high seas MPA already designated in the Antarctic, South Orkneys. Yeah, so, and, uh, what, what, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to just raise my seven as well. So um, I say my seven, but seven yeah. in the northeast of <laughs> Antarctica. So, um, you know, th it is possible. And, and Jim's right. It's, it, it's not something. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's very slow. I mean, the first uh, land-based uh, protected area was something 252 BC. The first marine protected area, the Fort Jefferson uh, Monument, was in 1935. And the first um, high seas marine protected area, we're looking at 2009-2010. Uh, um, if you discount the Pelagos Sanctuary in the, in the Mediterranean, which is which is a special case. So it is possible, but it's very, very difficult for the reasons we've uh, talked about. And we're now thinking about whether we need to have an implementing agreement to UNCLOS, whether the law of the sea needs extra help and modernization. And that might allow places like the Sargasso Sea that have a very strong science case to uh, become designated as marine protected areas. Um, so I think it's possible. I think it's urgent. I think we have charismatic people who can help, um, and I want to see it happen. Speaking of the UN law of the sea, do you think you know, uh, based on all of your areas of expertise, you know, do you think that the United Nations is sort of the first step? Do we need to get the UN behind the creation of MPAs in the high seas? Is that the first place we need to go to get larger governments involved? <clears throat> Could I come in on that? <clears throat> Surely. Uh, um, I mean, the, 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 the UN General Assembly has been talking about this for nearly 10 years. Um, I mean, it's, it's not just the protection of uh, the establishment of marine protected areas, but the, the uh, recognition of procedures to make sure that human activities, uh, which have possible adverse impacts, are, are regulated. Things like doing environmental impact assessment for new activities, for enhanced fishing activities, these sorts of things. And some sort of sp spatial planning, which has not, been, uh, has not been possible under the existing uh, Law of the Sea Convention. I don't, when the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated in, in the 1980s, there wasn't really an understanding of the huge resources that there are in the seabed, uh, or indeed of the importance that the ocean represents to the health of the planet. This is, we're talking pre-recognition of the importance of, of the issue of climate change, for example. So Law of the Sea Convention, it, it's, a, it's a great framework, but it does need supplementing. And one of the ways we can do that is by, uh, is by a new implementing agreement. In August, there's going to be uh, a, a meeting of, the, uh, UN, of a UN study group, working group, which is going to suggest um, or discuss the possibility of starting a process to negotiate in this supplementary agreement. But it could, if, it, if it's successful, it was still going to take a number of years. But I think the UN has got it on its agenda, uh, but it is controversial. There are other issues involved rather than just the establishment of protected areas. Um, Jim, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think several of us, but certainly ASOC is a member of a group that was formed two years ago called the High Seas Alliance. And if you can dig that out and show people its logo, that would be, I think, cool. Because we've got a whole bunch of groups that we, we decide we'll pool our interests as much as we can to lobby governments for this implementing agreement. And I think we've created as a family of friends almost uh, some really cool materials. We've had good briefings with the right kinds of people in the right governments up to a point. But it's a very, very tough, slow slog and I think the creativity, the vision is just lacking. So maybe this World Ocean Commission can come up with some new momentum. We need we need more momentum towards governing the high seas essentially. The, the, the thing I've stressed a couple times about Antarctica, <coughs> if you have a legal structure and you have principles, we have plenty of good principles in the Antarctic legal structure, uh, plenty of tools in the toolbox to do the right thing. So they don't really have any escape from their own conscience on that. 
But on other parts of the high seas, the basic uh, legal infrastructure just isn't there yet. So for the High Seas Alliance, we've been really promoting this implementing agreement as a step in that right direction to help create some new tools and, and, and some space, if you will, for people to talk seriously about achieving that. Um, I don't want to leave uh, Dr. Jimenez out, so I'm going to go to him, and I want to know what makes you feel inspired to get involved in the work that you do, and why do you think MPAs are so important? Well, I, I'm, I guess that I am from the generation that, as a kid, uh, watched uh, Jacques Cousteau, <laughs> and, and I think that, uh, that that's, that's what set me into, into the marine agenda since I was a kid. And, and, uh, and I have been a, you know, a believer that, that people really care for what they know, and they value what they need. And, and what we have been trying to do in all these years is to bring that knowledge of the marine environment to the people, make them understand that uh, the processes that happen there, the, 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 the biodiversity that is there, uh, and, and the linkages between those processes and uh, with, with their well-being. You know, the carbon sink, it, it, it was a a complicated concept a decade ago, but now a lot of people are thinking about uh, global global change and, and climate change and, and how the ocean is, is absorbing CO2 and, uh, and you know, so th this type of linkages, I think that are becoming more evident now that, I, that we have a better scientific base for it and that we are doing a better job in terms of media work, uh, bringing that knowledge into the, into the public. So, so I think that the, uh, that is something that, for us, it was shown uh, what was uh, over a year ago when when we set into our agenda to create a, an MPA, not in the high seas, but 500 kilometers away from or coast around the Cocoa Island, uh, and and it was it was uh, built through the help of uh, NATGEO in this case, where you know we we helped them to to make a, a, a film about the underwater beauties of this region. Then we took the whole government, the president, the Congress, into a into a cinema and showed them the film, and that made the difference. You know, and in a matter of months, we were able to create an over nine thousand square kilometers of protected area, and that and and I have to to to, to say that the public what was with us. You know, it was also a lot of social pressure in the media and the local media because after showing that around and make them know about what was there. The, the, the government couldn't say no. Uh, and, and, and I think that that, that linkage is be, between what is happening in the sea and, and, uh, and MPAs and importance of the MPAs there is, is, is key in, in our effort and we have to continue with that. I think that's a great success story. Uh, you know, I think overall people need to feel connected to the ocean more so than just going to the beach. Um, I think seeing these important films, learning about all the great important work you're all doing all across our beautiful ocean is really important. I'm going to provide um, information on our blog, The Daily Catch, as well as on our Google Plus profile about ways in which you can get yourself connected, um, learn more about more Viva, the Costa Rican Dome, the Costa Rican Pacific Dome, learn more about OSPAR, learn more about the Antarctic Southern Ocean Coalition, and learn more about the Sargasso Sea Alliance. I think it's really important you learn about these beautiful places in our ocean that need protection, and you know, even if you don't get a chance to possibly visit them or dive in these places or you know, see it firsthand, at least you can learn about it and read about it. Um, and I think each one of us can make some kind of effort on our own to be more educated and drive awareness. Obviously, you know, we can't encourage governments to make changes right away um, if we're not involved in the sort of large scale of uh, planning and policy, but I think it's important that we spread the word amongst our friends and family. And then when the opportunity comes to sign a petition or to get involved, that you're there and you know how to take action. So it's being curious, then getting involved, educating yourself, and then taking action when action is required. So I think it's really important that everybody makes some kind of effort to learn more about what's happening in our oceans. With that said, in closing, in an ideal situation, let's say that all international governing bodies were to say, hey, make your recommendations. What do you guys think? How many MPAs should we have? Um, where should they be? And who are we going to protect? In an ideal world, 
where would you want these MPAs to exist? And um, we'll close it out with sort of giving me your your fantasy Noah's Ark of MPAs. So um, I'll go down the line and I'll start with um, Dr. Jimenez. Well, you know, I, I have to be very local in my perspective, unfortunately, but, but certainly in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, we have, uh, we have a, a, a high need of, of going into deep waters environments. Uh, we, we, as I said before, we have created a lot of MPAs in the coastal area in the first five miles, 12 miles, uh, but not in, the, in, in deeper waters. And we have tremendous environments of seamounts, chains, and the, in, in the offshore areas uh, that, that are not uh, protected at all. Uh, and we have uh, deep trenches along the Central American coast, and which it must be a terrific environment in which we know very little of them still, and I think it, it would be very wise to protect them at, at this stage. I think that the, the, the agenda has to be carefully planned, though, uh, because we, we need to, to understand that, that we share the ocean with other users also, and that uh, those users uh, will have a say in, in, you know, in terms of where we declare MPAs, and that, that this has to be a, a coordinated effort with other, with other users because otherwise it's going to be, become a, a very conflictive uh, process. But, but uh, some of uh, our countries have already identified potential areas for MPA establishment, and I think that uh, we are moving ahead in the process of, uh, of cutting the attention of the government towards deep ocean instead of only coastal areas. Professor Johnson? Um, I think the U.S. has done great things in its own waters, but I'd like to see the U.S. ratify UNCLOS uh, to help with the high seas situation. I think we need to join up the dots and make the marine protected areas coherent. They have to be representative. If we're serious about protecting biodiversity, we need to make sure that uh, we adequately, adequately have a network, whatever percentage it is, that it meets the protection uh, and the conservation objectives that we've set. So I'd like to see a more coherent and a more strategic approach and involvement of small areas for discrete sites of huge areas where you're protecting uh, pelagic features or large areas of benthic ecosystems. Um, and I think we need to get on with it. David Freestone? Yeah, well, I'd like to see the Sargasso Sea, but I'm, I have a wider view than that. Um, the Sargasso Sea is one of ten... Uh, at least 10 sites which were, were identified by IUCN and also by Sylvia Earle as what she called her high seas hope spots. The establishment of large areas, she's been talking about this <coughs> a meeting in 1988 in Honolulu which she was organized on what she called wild ocean reserves. Big areas in the high seas where they, we can have what the World Heritage talks about uh, outstanding universal value. And we're just beginning to get to grips with those, the sort of issues, the sort of places that Jorge and, and David Johnson have talked about. So much more representative, um, a, a willingness to take big areas. The US, there's Papahana Makuakea, the, the big uh, North Hawaiian Islands Reserve is the biggest marine reserve in, uh, in the, in, you know, within national jurisdiction. We need to be looking at that sort of scale. And Jim? Well, I think all over the world, the potential is enormous. Uh, you look at the Arctic. I have a lot of colleagues working up in the Arctic and trying to create some serious MPAs up there. Of course, the politics are different because you not only have the 200-mile zones, you have the extensions of the continental shelves that some countries like Russia claim. And I totally agree with David Johnson. Uh, we need the U.S. To, to ratify the Law of the Sea Convention. That's ridiculous. You know, it's just a... We've got our hands tied behind our back on lots of levels by not ratifying that treaty. But anyway, wherever you go in the world, and I've been lucky in my life to travel almost all over the world, um, there are really rare and important ecosystems that need to be protected. There are degraded ecosystems that can be restored, recovered, and so forth. And I, I think people should think big. When people first asked us uh, three years ago, what does the Antarctic coalition, the Antarctic Alliance want around Antarctica, and we said, well, we want a minimum of 30 percent, and they said, 30 percent? said, yes, you've got to think big. These are large ecosystems. They're more or less, in the case of Ross Sea and Waddell Sea intact, parts of East, East Antarctica and so forth. Let's try to leave them intact so that we know 
what a healthy functioning ecosystem actually looks like. We can perhaps apply some learning somewhere else. But uh, I would like to see a huge global representative network of, of MPAs and reserves. Uh, and I'll pick a figure. I haven't ever done this before, but I'd like to see 20% of the ocean surface of the Earth protected in various logical ways. I'll support that. 20% protected. Let's make it happen. I think the important takeaway here is to you know, know that this is all our global heritage. The ocean is really the high seas belong to all of us. Um, I don't think any of us would like someone coming into our homes and just taking things out of our backyard or stealing all the socks out of our drawers and we're left with none or you know taking the food out of our fridge and that's exactly what we're doing in the high seas. Well not we, me and you, but we meaning large governments. They're going in the high seas and they're saying oh hey there's some fish let's take those and really it's not theirs to take. It's all of ours to have a say in what happens there. Um, I think all the work that each one of you is doing is really commendable, and without you, our ocean wouldn't be protected for future generations to come. So I hope to see more MPAs created. I'm going to provide whatever content and information I can on our website and, and give people access to the work that you're doing so they can become more educated and pass this information on. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining me today. I want to make sure people have ways in which they can get connected to you. Um, I'm going to put your websites up on the screen. Um, I want to say thank you so much for joining me. This is going to wrap up our week of Ocean Hangouts for World Oceans Day. World Oceans Day is tomorrow. And if there's anything that you can do, it is to teach what your friends, your kids, your colleagues, something about the ocean and the high seas that they never knew before. Um, I hope that our ocean is protected for generations to come, and I thank you and appreciate you all for your time. Thanks a lot. Nice. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>